Amen. I don't, I don't see how you can hear that without, uh, without at least smiling a little bit. Let me look you over, see, see if you are. Yeah, we're glad that you're here this morning. Pray for our youth and their leaders. Left out sometime early from Gatlinburg this morning. Did they not get out in a good time? Amen. Well, I'll tell you what, there's about 25 of them. And uh, so you pray for them while they travel this morning and uh, pray they'll get here safely. And we're missing a group of them. They'll, they'll be here uh, when we come back to worship, but you pray for them this morning, this being the first Sunday of the month. Of course, our secretary is with them. She did not leave me a birthday list, so guess what? We'll not do a birthday this morning. We'll, uh, we'll, do, it to, we'll do it one Sunday. You're not going to get by. We're going to call you out. And so, uh, but uh, we, uh, we'll do that another Sunday. I don't have that list this morning. Just make this special announcement, the CPR class that's going to be uh, this coming Saturday, January the 8th, 9 to noon, uh, in the vestibule. Uh, we need you to sign up. Uh, please do that if you want to come and take uh, some training for CPR. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board outside. There's one here, and we'd love for you to uh, participate if you have uh, these hours available uh, this coming Saturday. So please keep that in mind, uh, if you will. Read the other announcements in the bulletin, if you will, this morning, and we're glad that you're here. Uh, we pray for Miss May Randolph today in the passing of her sister, uh, the funeral will be tomorrow in South Carolina. And then in our community, Mr. Cono Hensley, who passed away, his funeral will be uh, one day this week. We're not sure what day it is in Burnsville. And uh, so I'll be going to help minister to the family. And so you pray, if you will, for uh, this family uh, that lives right near our church. And uh, they, they really don't have anybody and uh, so uh, we're going to try to minister to this family and help them out uh, in the burial of Mr. Hensley this coming week. All right, we're glad you're here this morning. If you're visiting, we're glad you're here. Good way to start out the new year this morning by worshiping together. And uh, so we'll ask you, if you will, to stand with us. Everybody stand with us. We'll just sing a chorus of praise to the Lord.
are coming now. We're going to worship him Hallelujah. with our gifts this morning. We not only give our gifts to him, but we give our heart to him. Amen. One of the courses Amen. we've sung throughout this month, what can I give him? Well, do you know he has everything? He owns everything? Amen. Just give him your heart. Give him your worship. Give him your praise this morning. Will you join with me this morning? Father, we praise you. We, we know that in heaven today that all praise and honor and glory is being given to our Lord who is high and lifted up. All majesty, all worship, all praise is unto him. And one day we're going to be there with the saints of God. And we're going to worship in like manner. But thank you, Lord, we can do that even here and now. <coughs> out of our hearts of gratitude. You've been so good to us, so gracious to us. You have taken care of all of us. This morning we offer thanks to you and praise. Yes. I pray that every song we sing.
another one and told them to sing it. And they're up here gasping for breath and saying, well, how about you singing it? Amen. In fact, most of the things I don't know about tomorrow. Would you have to agree with that? Not just a few things, but most of the things about tomorrow. I don't understand. But one thing I do know, I know who holds tomorrow. And the same one that's got tomorrow in his hand has got me in the other hand. Amen. I sort of challenged my class this morning. I saw all these youth that are, that are not here this morning. There's the lively bunch. I said, now you go over there in church and be lively. Don't just go over and sit down. And so I may just keep this choir up here and just let them amen me while I'm preaching. Amen. You sing this with us. If you, if you know it, sing along with us. Yes.
is down here, but there's, there is a place that is worry-free, and that is when we get home. I failed to mention a little bit ago about Josh and Rebecca. I uh, need to pray for Josh and Rebecca. He's in Grace Hospital. He has pneumonia, and he also has a blood clot in his leg. Rebecca has been there with him uh, since they admitted him uh, in the middle of the night Thursday. And I assured her that we are praying for her and for him. Not only does he need prayer, but she needs a lot of prayer uh, to be in there with him. Please read all the announcements in the bulletin, if you will, and take advantage of these opportunities that we have. And again, pray for all of our youth and their leaders. And when they come back, we'll pray for their safety while they uh, return today. All right. Uh, we're glad you're here. Uh, you glad to be here this morning? Yeah. Amen. Amen. We got to be somewhere. I mean, everybody's got to be somewhere. And I'm just glad to be here this morning. Would you like to stand with us, please? And we're going we're gonna to play. They're going to play. We'll sing a little chorus in a minute. If you feel safe and you want to do it, you can get out of your pew and go speak to somebody, shake hands with them. And uh, if you really feel safe, hug their neck. That'll be all right. And just uh, if you see guests with us this morning, go speak to them, introduce yourself, and then we'll sing a little chorus together. Will you do that while they play? Children going to children's church. Just follow them right over through here. Children worship this morning. Be over near the building.
just in case there's somebody. We try to make sure that everybody's spoken to, everybody gets their hands shaken when they come to church. In case there's somebody here that did not get a friendly handshake or speak to, raise your hand and I'll send my wife over there to, uh, and she will, uh, because she'll do that. I promise you, she will t- she'll take care of that. And uh, she might be slow getting around to it, but she'll finally get around to it. And in case you wonder who that is sitting on the seat with her, that's my son and my daughter-in-law and my other grandson. Uh, he, don't, he don't like to be called the other one. He kind of likes to be called the first one. And then there are times he wants to be called the only one. But he's not the only one. We've got one over yonder that uh, youth have been taken care of. And, uh, but we're glad they came up today to be here. And I'm especially glad they came after him. And uh, they're <laughs> I just, just thought I'd mention that in passing. They're going to take him back home. Uh, they're like most of you. They've they got to start school tomorrow. And so, uh, so we're glad that you're here this morning. I learned a lot of things when I was growing up as a boy. A lot of things I've tried to forget. Uh, But a lot of things stuck with you, stayed with you uh, from your childhood. And where I lived, where I was raised, of course everybody in the community where I was raised, uh, we were all in the same situation. Our parents worked in the cotton mill, and so we, if we had enough food on the table and enough clothes to wear, we thought we were rich. You know, we were pleased. We were happy to have that. And, uh, of course, we didn't. We're just getting over Christmas, and I, I'm sure all the parents and grandparents here are shocked, you know, the amount of stuff that kids get in our day. Uh, well, there was a time, there was a day, when that didn't happen at my house, I mean, we had, uh, we had enough, but we didn't get toys all the time. Uh, if you ever got one, boy, I'll tell you, you treasured it because that's a long time before you ever got another one. Uh, and uh, some of you that are my age or, or younger, uh, you remember growing up, when I was growing up, we, uh, we had on Sunday what you call Sunday dinner. And the reason we called it Sunday dinner is because we had something we didn't have all week long. And what we had on Sunday, that's the only time you got it. And, uh, you know, most of the time it was... Uh, you know, we'd have a chicken or something, some meat on Sunday. But during the week, we rarely ever had that. Now, somebody said it's beans and taters one day and it's taters and beans the next day. Uh, you know, and, and we survived, didn't it? We lived. And uh, that might be the reason some of us love it so good now because that's what you grew up on. That's all you had. And uh, so uh, Sundays were very special because uh, we always had something to eat that we did not have to eat during the week. And then when it came Christmas time, uh, you were excited about any toys that you got uh, because you didn't, get a, you didn't get a floor full of toys. Uh, you got one or two things, and then that was, uh, you were thrilled about that. I thought this week about, uh, about those things and reminiscing about those things and uh, thought about some of the childhood days uh, that when we got out to play, uh, while we didn't have toys that you bought at the store, you had to create your own toys. You had to make your own toys. And of course, being raised uh, in, in a community in a, in a little place where there were a lot of cousins, a lot of boys, uh, one of our favorite things to do, we'd light out in the morning. And it was a day when you could go out in the morning and play all day long and play in the woods and never come home till it got dark. 
and your parents didn't worry about you. They didn't have any fear that somebody was going to hurt you. Nobody was going to come by and pick you up. Uh, in fact, I sort of think my mom and daddy was glad when I left the house in the morning and didn't come home till supper time. Uh, but one of the games that we, we would play, you know, uh, we'd see it on TV, uh, was Cowboys and Indians. And we played that game in the woods. We had about 30 acres of land, 50 acres of land behind my daddy's house. And so we'd go in the woods and get lost for the day. And that was our favorite game. Uh, I, don't, I, I do understand now, I didn't understand then, since I was one of the younger ones and all the others was older than me, uh, they always had the guns and I was the one that always had to get shot. And I was the one that was supposed to die. And they said, oh, we'll let you have a gun sometime later, you know. you just keep on shooting you. But our guns were made out of sticks. You know, you'd find a stick somewhere that kind of favored a gun and then you would, uh, you would make a, you'd make a stick gun out of it. And you would, uh, you would uh, play uh, war or you would be uh, in cowboys and Indians all day long shooting one another. And uh, they were not real guns. They were not real soldiers. Uh, but uh, it was play. It was play guns and play action. Um, that fulfilled our summer times together. You know, of learning how to play, how to shoot, how to die. But at the end of the day, everybody got up. Nobody was hurt. Nobody was wounded. Nobody died. And then we'd go to the house and then we'd sit around the table and we'd eat together and talk together about the day. Well, I've come here this morning to tell you that as a believer, we're not in a make-believe battle. That we're in a real spiritual battle uh, as a child of God. And uh, this battle will go on until we leave this world. And we're all involved in that spiritual warfare. And one of the main areas of attack from our enemy is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 where Paul wrote this endearing letter to his friends in the faith. And you keep in mind that Paul only spent three weeks with them. He came into Thessalonica, he preached the gospel unto them and they became believers. And after three weeks, he departed. And so when you read about these believers, they are young in their faith. They, are, they haven't had time to grow. They haven't t had time to mature. And Paul was in another location and he thought about these young believers and he just could not uh, restrain himself from writing a letter to them uh, to check up on them and to see how they were doing. And he says this beginning in verse 1 of chapter 3, and if you will notice the theme of this chapter, he mentions it several times. He says in verse 1, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, Paul said, I stood it as long as I could, I just had to find out about you. We thought it to be it, it good to be left at Athens alone and send Timothy, our brother and minister of God, our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith that no man should be moved by these afflictions. They were not having it easy. There were afflictions upon them. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. For verily when we were with you, 
We told you before that we should suffer tribulation even as it came to pass and you know. For this cause when I could no longer forbear I sent to know your faith. I just want you to notice what he's concerned about. I want to know something about your faith lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. But now when Timothy came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity and that you have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you and all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live if we stand fast in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God. Night and day praying exceedingly, that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men even as we do toward you. To the end he may establish your heart's unblameable in holiness before God even our Father as the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all of his saints. If you picked up on it, read him very carefully out of these verses. Four or five times Paul says to them, I'm writing to find out about your faith. If you ask most people this morning, how are you doing spiritually? Well, they may bring up a few matters that are external. They may talk about, well, preacher, I try to read my Bible every day. I try to come to church. I try to be faithful in my giving. <coughs> and they'll talk about all of these outward things that are a part of our life. Uh, they'll talk about, if you ask the average church, well, how is your church doing? I get that call uh, occasionally. I talk to pastors and they call. Ran into someone that knew me the other day and uh, he wanted to know how we were doing during all of this pandemic. And really, he didn't want to know how we were doing. He just wanted to tell me how they were not doing. And he talked about all the things that they were not able to do and, but if you ask the average pastor, they'll talk about how many people show up on Sunday in the service. They'll talk about the size of their building. They'll talk about how much money that people are willing to give. But when Paul wrote this letter to these group of believers, that was not what was on his mind. Uh, Paul did not ask the question, are you in a church building yet? I preached three weeks there. And uh, you are a group of believers. Uh, are you in a building? Uh, what size of building do you have? Or uh, could you tell me about your offerings? How much money have you been taking in? Oh no, that wasn't the main concern to Paul. Paul said these things are not the issue uh, in, on my heart. Uh, he says, I'm not asking you about the size of your congregation. Uh, he doesn't say, have you got a music program ready, already singing in church? What kind of choir do you have? What kind of music are you singing? Uh, have you, uh, you go through a lot of issues in our day uh, about what all that you've got going on. What kind of ministry do you have? Uh, no, that wasn't what Paul asked. Paul said, there's only one thing that is on my heart. He said, I want to know about your faith. I, wanna, I want you to examine your faith. 
How's your faith life? Where are you in this matter of believe in God and faith in God? Paul said, I, my ministry is to concern about your faith. And can I stand here this morning as a pastor and say to you, that my ministry is not to fill up this church building. You can have a church full of people and a full of, got a lot of people that got empty hearts. But I'm telling you, it's not my ministry to fill up this church building. My ministry from the Lord is to preach this word in such a way that it will build faith in the heart of the people of God. Are you aware that God, hear me this morning, there are a lot of things we think God needs that God does not need this morning. Do you know, and I praise God for this choir and praise God for the musicians that are so dedicated to serve and will play and lead us in worship. But are you aware this morning that God doesn't need our music this morning to honor Him? If he wanted to get a perfect choir, let him get a group of angels together and let them sing praises unto God. I tell you what, I found angels never sing off key. I mean, they always sing perfectly. Oh, listen to me this morning. In fact, God, God wants to see our faith this morning. He examines the heart of a person. And where is your faith? And we're facing a new year on this first Sunday. And I want to talk about what amazes Jesus. What is it that amazes Jesus? I fear sometime when we, when we sing or when we preach or when we get up and do our thing, we think, boy, Jesus must be amazed at that. Well, I, I'm here to tell you this morning, none of those things amaze him. He, he is amazed, the Bible said. I want to talk about our amazing the Lord Jesus. Uh, I will read to you. Uh, he, he's not amazed by a lot of things that we say that he is. Uh, but when he was on this earth, there were only two times in the ministry of Jesus, the Bible said that Jesus was amazed. He was astonished at two things while he was on the face of this earth. Can I say to you this morning, he is never amazed at your righteousness or my righteousness. I mean, you don't come to God and say, boy, I must amaze the Lord this morning about how righteous I am. Well, I want to tell you this morning, that he is the one that is totally righteous. He is totally pure. He never looked at Matthew, I don't think he ever looked at Matthew, and said, Matthew, you're smarter than all the other disciples that I've got. I'm just amazed that I've got you as one of my disciples. In case you're sitting here this morning and you think surely Jesus is amazed with me, can I just let the air out of your balloon and tell you he's not amazed with any of us this morning? <laughs> oh, no. He could have said, Matthew, you're a financial genius and I've got to have you as one of my disciples. But one thing that amazed the Lord Jesus, and I want to point it out in our scripture this morning. Scripture's on the screen if you... If you don't want to turn, but a little story over in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 7, this talking about Jesus, when it ended all of his sayings in the audience of the people that entered into Capernaum, there was a certain centurion servant who was dear unto him, was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. 
And they came to Jesus and they besought him instantly saying <coughs> that he was worthy for whom he should do, should do this. For he loveth our nation. He just not bragging about uh, all the good things about this man, how worthy he was. He's a good citizen. He loves our nation. In fact, he loves church. He built a synagogue. Boy, it'd get high on our list, wouldn't we? When we think that somebody, here's a good, good citizen in our nation, and brother, he gives everything he's got down to the church and building us a place where we can go to church. He must be high on the list. And Jesus, verse 6 says, went with them. And when he was now not far from the home, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Wherefore neither thought I myself worthy to come to thee, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. I want to tell you, you only get something from God, here's a good position to get in. Other people may brag on me, but I'm not going to brag on myself. Other people may think I'm special. I don't think I'm special, he said. He said, I'm not even worthy for you to come under my roof. I, I never thought myself worthy, verse 7 says. But if you'll just speak the word, my servant shall be healed. For I am also a man under authority. Could I, could I make a statement? I don't care how high and mighty you think you are. Just remember, there is somebody higher than you. And this guy had ever, everything outwardly. But he said, I am under authority. Just remember. All of us are under somebody's authority. And all of us are under God's authority. Don't you just love it when people in church think they're bigger than God? Don't you just love it when people think they're more important than God? Why, they'd close the doors of that church if I wasn't there. Nobody said amen to that. You, you ever been in a place like that? Oh, I've been in a place like that. I'm the greatest. I'm the big cheese around here. Yeah. I could say a few things about that. I'm not going to say in, a, in this congregation this morning. That little old church where my son grew up, a little church over in Avery County. And... Uh, I just, I'm just going to be honest with you this morning. I never pastored a church anywhere, Baptist church anywhere, that somebody didn't think they were more important than anybody else, and they were the big chief down at the church. Could I just say to you this morning, we're all nothing, but God is everything. That's that old mountain man over there. I became the pastor. I wasn't sure he was too happy about that. He sat there every Sunday. He is my neighbor. <laughs> sat there every Sunday. And trust me, I trust me. They didn't have a lot. They didn't, they didn't have much. But the group in there loved God, gave what they had to the Lord. They said, Preacher, if we can't feed you and your family, if we can't pay enough for you at the church, come on to our house. You can eat at our house three times every day if you want to. I tried them out on that, see if they meant business. Amen. That old man sat there every Sunday and they put up the offering, which wasn't much, and he'd write it down in his little book. He'd write it down. He'd write it down every Sunday. And uh, he thought he was the, uh, the, 
the big chief. Eventually, we want to spend some money to do something. We're just going to build an outside shed so we wouldn't have to eat outside in the back of a car. We're just going to build a shed so we could put our food under it, sitting by Tow River, and eat. Now, I'm telling you what. You ain't spirits that, you ain't lived. We said we need some money to build this, just a, a shelter to put over. He stood up in the church, he said. We've got money to do that. Somebody said, no, we don't have any money. We're just talking about it this morning. He said, oh, I've got a record right here. He pulled out his little notebook in his pocket. He said, I've got an account of every, every penny we took in. And I've got a total of how much we got. And one of the gracious deacons got up and said, but brother, what you don't understand, we do have expenses down your church. We have to pay a power bill, and we have to pay a gas bill, and we got a pastor. And oh Lord, when he said we've got a pastor that we're trying to feed and take care of, that sort of rubbed him the wrong way. He got up, and he marched out of that church and uh, so every Sunday we'd go to church and right up from my house was the side of a mountain he'd, he'd make sure he walked in front of my house he walked right through my yard and he's headed up to the side of that mountain and he's going up there sit down and him and God was going to have church <laughs> He said, what'd you do about it? I didn't do a thing. I just prayed for him, being a good neighbor. And uh, so every Sunday he did that. Every Sunday he'd go up there and sit on the side of that mountain. One of them old mountain men would get over there and he'd start ringing that church bell every Sunday. And the sound of that church bell would ring up and down that holler. And God made sure the sound of that church bell sort of went up there to that mountain where he was. <laughs> and he sat up there and he was mad at church and he was mad at me and he wasn't going to do a thing. Thought he was bigger than God. He sat up there. He sat up there week after week, month after month. In my heart, of course I had to repent of this, but in my heart, I said let him stay up there all summer long. When it gets winter time up here, Oh, brother, he'll come off of that mountain. And he eventually came off of that mountain. And he came into church one Sunday. And he got up. And he said, I really thought that when I left, the church would close the doors. <laughs> and they wouldn't have church anymore. But he said, I've been sitting up on the side of that mountain for about three months. And far as I can tell, every Sunday they were ringing the church bells and people were coming to church. He said, that finally dawned upon me. Why, they ain't closing the doors because of me. Best thing I can do is just get back down there and go to church with the rest of them. I'm here to tell you, here's a guy that thought, I'm not worthy. I don't give me any credit. I'm a man already under authority. He had authority, but he was under authority. And here's what Jesus said in verse 9. When he heard these things, he marveled at him. He was astonished. Turned him about and said to the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. No not in Israel. I want to tell you what amazed Jesus was this man's faith. This man's faith. I could say a lot of things about this man, who he was. I'll let Holly put those things up there. Three things I want to do is say about him was what he was, what he did, who he was, kind of man that he was, and Jesus was amazed 
at him. I, I wonder when Jesus said, I, I find no such faith. I have not found anybody that's got this kind of faith. Can I ask you this morning, Jesus looking for you. He's not looking at the house you're living in. He's not looking at the car you drove to church this morning. In fact, you can't impress somebody that's got it all and who knows it all. Do you know God doesn't need my knowledge? He doesn't need my wisdom. He already knows it all. He already has it all. He can do it all. So I'm telling you, when you come with yours and I come with mine, we're not astonishing him. We're not amazing him. There's something he's looking for down in our heart, and that's the presence of faith. Whether you've got faith in God. One other time, Jesus was amazed. There was a Canaanite man had a daughter possessed with demons. There were others coming to Jesus. He acknowledged their faith. There was one person, there was a group of people that had the absence of faith. There was not only the presence of faith in their life, but they were the absence of faith. Can you believe of all places in the hometown of Jesus in Nazareth, where he grew up, where they saw him. And the Bible said that when Jesus came into his hometown, into Nazareth, he could not do many mighty miracles for them except lay his hands on a few people and heal the sick. He could not do great things for them because they did not have faith in God. Literally, they tied the hands of Jesus because they had no faith. Can I say to this church, if you want to see God unleash His hands and His mighty power in this church this coming year, just believe God and trust God and have faith in God this morning. In fact, Jesus said, Matthew chapter 9, it's according to your faith, will it be done unto you? Faith is more than talk. More than, we're, we're sort of like the people in the days of Isaiah. Isaiah 29 and verse 13. These people come near to me with their mouth. They honor me with their lips. But their hearts are far from me. Popular thing in our day to say I believe. Popular thing to use certain words. You know, we have this mentality of positive confession. These are the prosperity preaching preachers. All you got to do is just blab it and grab it. <laughs> just say it and it's yours. Just use the Bible for you. <laughs> what to say is, don't, don't, when you come to the altar, when you come forward, don't say to God you've got a problem. Oh, don't confess you've got a problem. Don't ever, don't admit you're sick. That's not living by faith. When pastor said to his people, now when you come down here for prayer, don't ever come down here and tell me you've got a cold or a flu. Just say I've got the symptoms of these things. And they want to play mind games with you. The faith that God wants you to have is facing reality. This is real. But faith in God. I don't have the symptoms. I've got the real deal. <laughs> Amen? Oh, listen. Faith. Romans chapter 4, verse 
19 through 21, we've been preaching steady in the life of Abraham. We talk about him tonight in his greatest hour when he had to have faith. The Bible said in, in the New Testament in Romans chapter 4, verse 19 through 21, Abraham not being weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. When he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. I ask you this morning, whatever God's promised you, do you think God's able? Do you believe God's able to perform it? You can't ask him anything that he cannot do. Ask the average church member today, how you doing? Well, I'm struggling. I'm struggling. Faith in God. I'll be honest with you, where most people break down in the Christian life is not for them to try harder, do more, give more. It has nothing to do with it. But it's looking unto Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith. For the Bible said, the just shall live by faith you know the greatest strongest Christian this morning is not the one who has achieved the most it is the one who has received the most you receive faith in God faith pleases God and God is pleased with our faith You're going to be called upon to demonstrate your faith. You say, Pastor, a lot of members of this church not here this morning. Their faith has been attacked. Are they going to be strong in the faith? Are you going to be strong in the faith? Are you going to be weak in the faith? When the battle gets raging, what about our faith? Is it more than just talk? More than just words? When I was pastoring in Spruce Pine, um, the church graciously, um, I take it that they wanted to support me, wanted to help me. It wasn't that they were saying, I don't think they were saying, oh boy, you need it. So I, I traveled four days a week, get up early in the morning, travel to Fruitland, and uh, leave before daylight, get back in at dark, trying to better prepare myself for the ministry. I felt if God gave his best to me, I ought to give my best to him. So I, I did that. In our classroom, <coughs> the first, first week I was there, which I knew nobody in my class. There was one guy that he came two days the first week. He dropped out of school. Nobody heard from him. I had no, I had, nobody knew why he did. But he wasn't there. Our teacher, bless her heart, was... Uh, Already hitting about 75. But once they got a name on the roll, every time we went to class, she called out his name. And he had already dropped out and quit. She called out his name. Well, I keep in mind, we had some young, young preachers uh, that hadn't grown up. So when she called out his name, one of them would always say, Here, she would mark him present. And uh, next time it's in class, somebody, she'd call out his name, somebody else would speak up and say, I'm here, 
She had checked him present. We went about four months. She thought he was in class every time we had class. Because somebody was saying, we're here. That became a running joke in our class. They said, well, who's going to answer here for him today? <laughs> who's going to step up and say, because she, she didn't know. And for three months, she checked him present when he was not present. I thought, what are we going to do when it comes graduation time? And he graduates, and he hadn't been in one class the whole time we were there. Why am I wasting all of my time here? But I think there's going to come a situation in your life. God's going to call your name. And are you going to answer with faith? And say, here am I, Lord. I'll step up by faith. I'm not going to be absent. I'm not going to give in. I'm not giving up. And just our faith is going to amaze Jesus. The one who is amazing will be amazed if he finds faith in our heart and in this world. Will you stand with me this morning? I think it's a question nobody's asking. Where's your faith? Jesus talked about people that had no faith. He talked about people who had small faith. He talked about people who had weak faith. He talked about people that had strong faith. He talked about people that had mature faith. Where are you at this morning? <coughs> you can't hide whether you have the presence of faith in your heart or whether you don't have faith. This morning, if you're here and you're not saved, you're not a believer, just childlike faith. Is all he's looking for. This morning he speak to your heart. Do you need to say, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief? I need, I need stronger faith. I need faith in God, not faith in man, not faith in myself, not faith in others, but faith in God. For the Bible said, he that cometh to God must believe that he is that he's a rewarder of them that seek him. It's only by faith that we can be in the presence of God. Now, Father, I feel you put these thoughts on my heart to share this morning. I pray we'll receive them. Lord, we'll, our faith will be activated. <clears throat> There's somebody that don't have faith this morning. It's a gift from God. You'll give them faith to believe. And there are many struggling this morning that fear the coming year. The Lord, you'll give them faith. You'll strengthen their faith. And the one thing Paul was only concerned about in that church at Thessalonica, how's your faith? Are you still believing? Are you still trusting? Are you still walking with God? How's your faith? Are you growing in your faith? Lord, that's on the heart of every pastor. His house, the faith of his believers, of his, of his members, is your faith strong in the Lord. Believing in God, not believing in man, not believing in self, not believing in what you can do, only what God can do. I pray we'll honor you. You'll be honored with our faith and we'll honor you this morning in Jesus' name. Look up this way. We're going to sing it together. Trust and obey. If you have faith in him, it leads to our obedience. We're going to sing it together. Do you want to sing it from your heart this morning? Sing it to the Lord. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, when a
in the Lord this year? Well, some of you do. You want to be happy in Jesus? It's all right to be happy in the Lord. And I can tell you, he can be trusted. You know how you got this far? By trusting in him. He just wants you to have stronger faith. That is the goal. That is the effort that my desire is when I stand this pulpit is to target your faith and for your faith to be strong. Lord, we thank you this morning. I pray your blessings upon this group of people and the other churches that are near us. We pray for them today. Your will be done in their lives. Help us to be faithful to you in the days to come. We don't know what this year will hold, but we're trusting in a God who already knows knows our life from beginning to end and everything in between. Pray you'll bless every family, every individual here this morning. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Smile at somebody and speak to them.